What would you do if a deadly virus wiped out your circle of friends and lovers? Vibrant young men who are living their lives for the first time, living out and proud, making new friends, falling in love, having hopes and dreams and ambitions. For the first time, here are the personal stories behind the HIV AIDS pandemic. Told by the people who were there and the people who supported them. This is their story and what happened after 82. One of the first people to become infected was the actor Jonathan Blake. What was frightening was that I was sort of lying in a, they, they, they put, I don't know whether it was just sort of, you know, gay boys, but we were all put inside wards. So I'm sort of lying in this bed, sort of feeling pretty wretched. And next to me, in the next bed, there is this guy who is obviously on the way out. This person I had met in 1979, no, 1976, 77, when I'd been out on tour um, from Regent's Park. We then, the show that I was in, uh, Love's Labour's Lost, went out on tour, and I'd met him in Norwich. And there was this same guy who was lying in, uh, in the next bed, and that was freaky because, you know, I could tell that, that he was not long for this world. And I was thinking, is this anything to do with me? Is, you know, there's some sort of connection. So it was really, you know, it was frightening. And basically they came back with the result that it was, uh, I had HTLV3. This was uh, what HIV was called before that. Eventually, sort of, they, they combined the sort of the French, which was LAV, and, and the HTLV3, and they came up with HIV. Uh, immune, human immunodeficiency virus is, uh, is what it actually stands for. Um, and I was sort of gutted. I was feeling very isolated where I was sort of uh, was living. I sort of... Uh, didn't know sort of what to do. AIDS is already the number one killer amongst the male population of New York. In Britain, there are more than 10,000 people who come into contact with the so-called gay plague. I went along to uh, an STI clinic uh, for a routine checkup, And um, at that point in time, I'd begun to hear about this disease that was killing gay men in America. The clinician said that um, because I was gay, I probably had it and should have the test. Um, and that was the, the extent of my pre-test counselling at that time. Um, so I had the test and uh, was told to come back in 10 days' time. So I went home and I'd, I told a couple of friends what was going on and we were all pretty, uh, pretty scared. So I returned to the hospital 10 days later and um, got a positive test result. And the doctor um, informed me that I should go away and uh, prepare for the worst that I probably had a year to 18 months to live. Um, so um, I remember walking, walking away from the, from the hospital, which is in, was in central London, and going home to a small group of friends who were waiting for me at home. And we were all in a state of complete shock, I think. Um, we didn't know how to react or what to think. Um, and I really couldn't get my head around the idea that you know, I only had potentially 18 months to live. There was nothing that we could do about it. There was, um, there were no drugs to treat it. Uh, there was no vaccine. Um, we had, if you like, a, a new and obviously very important um, illness, disease uh, coming. And for the first time I could remember at any rate, uh, there was very little you could do in terms of countering it. Blood tests can reveal the antibodies to the virus in a victim's bloodstream. At the moment, it appears only one in ten people with such antibodies develop the full AIDS syndrome, where the body's ability to fight infection is destroyed. The media but coverage was toxic. The individual Into this hostile the arena, Jonathan Grimshaw came out to reveal his HIV status. 
Well, a friend of mine uh, rang me up one day and said somebody who we had both slept with in the past was in hospital with, uh, with AIDS. And uh, the hospital where he was being treated wanted me to go in so they could uh, have a look at me and, and check my health. So I went in and uh, they sort of took a look at me and asked me some questions and uh, said, you seem to be fine. We're not particularly worried about you, but come back again in six months. So I did that a couple of times. And then on one of the occasions, they said they took some blood and then I went back a little bit after that and they said, well, we, we tested your blood for what we think is this new virus that uh, we think causes AIDS and your test was positive. So I, I was completely un, unprepared because they'd been telling me I seemed fine. So you know, suddenly finding out that I had the virus that could cause AIDS was uh, kind of going completely out of the blue. And, and, um, and I really, uh, I mean, I didn't go to pieces, but I just could not uh, think how I was going to live from now on with this virus. I actually left sixth form early due to homophobic bullying and got a job as a DJ in a local pub. And uh, on a nightly basis, people would stand in front of the DJ box and call me Rock Hudson and say, when are you going to die? That's what you deserve. And I can remember vividly, you know, guys that one minute had been very healthy, wearing baseball caps. Baseball caps seemed to be the thing. These guys that had been out proud, having a good time, and suddenly they were all wearing baseball caps and keeping their heads down because they were obviously losing weight in their faces. And I can remember just thinking, how sad, how sad. I decided I was going to commit suicide. That was it. I didn't really know quite how I was going to do it, but sort of, I sort of decided that it would be the Roman method. So I would have a hot bath, sort of, you know, have a few drinks and then just slash my wrists. I was having to think about, you know, not potentially not having a future anymore. Um, and it wasn't known at that time, if you had this virus, whether you would definitely go on to get aid. So, so what do you do? I mean, how do you kind of plan for a future when everything's so uncertain? And I was told that if I had certain kinds of sex with somebody, I could give them a disease that could kill them. So I thought, well, nobody is, Nobody is ever going to uh, love me ever again. I was just at the beginnings of a social work career. I just got my social work uh, qualifications and just got my, my foot on the sort of bottom runners of the ladder. Um, I was in a very stressful job. Um, and I think within probably within two or three months of diagnosis, um, I decided to go on long-term sick leave. And I got to know them very well. They were people like me. They were my age, most of them. They even lived in the same sort of streets and roads that I lived in. And as, as one of my colleagues said, when one of her favourite patients died, I know you shouldn't have a favourite, but you, you did. And she said, you know, he went to the same restaurants that I did, which is silly, but I think when you're a young doctor, you are used to dealing with old people dying but you're not used to young people dying. They're not people who are like you. And particularly those of us who went into sexual health, one of the reasons that I liked it was because somebody would come in with gonorrhea and you could give them some antibiotics and they got better. And suddenly I had these patients who I saw on a regular basis slowly declining and I had to watch them die. And that was very difficult. Uh, it was also an enormous privilege. ...to cut down on the number of different sexual partners. Terence Higgins died on the 4th of July, 1982. He was one of the first. Higgins's death sparked fear within the gay community. But his partner, Dr. Rupert Whittaker, wanted to turn his death into something positive. So with some of his close friends, they set up a trust in his name. I met Terry at a nightclub on Charing Cross Road uh, called Bang. 
Uh, it was where you went in the door and you went downstairs into a into an area. And um, I don't know if I don't know if my memory is absolutely right here, but it seemed to me that that I remember that there was a a raised area, a raised dance floor area. It might be just that there was a separate dance floor area. But anyway, I saw this um, bloke there who I thought was uh, very attractive. And he, that was the time of the clones where check shirts, short hair, big moustache, etc. And uh, Terry was, a, was very clony. And he had the weirdest way of dancing. Really, really weird. It was a kind of slinky thing. It was like, hmm. anyway, I was a bit mesmerised. Uh, anyway, it's kind of slowly inched closer kind of thing and then he, then he uh, clocked me, etc. And very shortly he came over and said hello. And uh, he turned out to be a really nice guy. He was your mother in the gay world. He really was um, an anchor. You know, I shared homes with him in London and Amsterdam and Kensington. And you'd get up in the morning at, say, 9 or 10 o'clock and Terry would have done all the ironing. He would appeal the spuds, ready for lunch five hours' time, and he'd have the meat in the oven. It was all, everything was organised, and he was a, 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 a clockwork, precise man. I'd been dancing with Terry. We were great friends. Um, while his other half, Rupert, was away in university, uh, Terry was a great friend and associate, and he kind of looked after me. I mean, I was younger than, than, than Terry, and he was a... Uh, um, a confidant, and, um, but very much um, a protector. Um, and I felt safe with Terry. I have a lot of memories of Terry. Um, I'm, they're kind of all, all over the place. Uh, I'm very kind of fragmented, but um, he used to make, when he was sick, which I didn't realize he was sick at that time, uh, he used to make me dinner, but he wouldn't eat himself. Uh, but he was certain that I was going to eat because he was kind of taking care of me, if you will. And um, he, I, the way he spoke, uh, the way he pronounced certain things, some of his facial gestures, the way he pronounced uh, year in a kind of a sort of a Welsh, Welsh way. And um, his toenails, um, because they used to tickle my feet in bed. And, uh, yeah, just lots of different things. They were yeah, really, really nice. And his gentleness, too. So welcome to heaven. By the way, my name is Kimberly. Have a good night. We were all at heaven, April, May, that sort of time. And he collapsed. I remember we were waiting in the, in the bar for him to come in, and he came in with some friends. A shadow of himself. It was, I hadn't seen him for a couple of months at this, since Christmas maybe, New Year. And he really wasn't well, he really wasn't well. And he had this rash you could see on his neck. And he kept sitting down all the time. Now Terry, anyone will tell you, was up on that dance floor dancing from 10 o'clock to three in the morning. You would not get Terry off the dance floor, constantly dancing, constantly partying. And there he was sitting down exhausted. And he went to the bar and someone came up and said, Terry's collapsed. And we get up there and an ambulance was called. He was taken to St. Thomas's Hospital. Is it? Yes, yeah, St. Thomas's Hospital. And within, a, I think the following day or within two days, he discharged himself. And then I think it was probably about two or three weeks later that, um, again, he was taken quite ill and he went into hospital, and we visited him a couple of times, but there was no sense of um, impending doom at all. I knew that I was um, ill with the same disease that Terry had. This was before any um, virus had been discovered, and uh, I had actually been an Ill, uh, uh, Ill a year before um, I'd met Terry, and he had also been ill before he met me. Um, and so, I knew that there was something, some, something really problematic and that I was most likely going to die from the same disease that Terry had, even though he didn't have a name at that time. I was really, really uh, sick. I lived with my father in a flat in Bloomsbury on the third floor, I think. Just 
getting up the stairs. And I had to um, rest at each landing because I was too tired to uh, walk up in one go. Uh, and I was 19 at the time. Uh, I was just exhausted. And uh, at night, um, my, my father helped me do this uh, at times, I had to get up once or twice um, in order to change the sheets, um, put new towels underneath the sheets because they were soaked right through from night sweats. And, uh, and I was also losing quite a lot of weight. So uh, I knew that I was sick, but it was, it, it was several years later, maybe three years later, when I was actually training as an immunologist um, that I tested my own blood in the lab, and I knew I was positive anyway. Um, it was still called HTLV-3 then. And uh, sure enough, the uh, Western Bloc came back, back and it was um, obvious that I was infected. It wasn't a surprise to me. And I got this phone call from my friend Arthur saying, uh, Terry had died. I thought he meant somebody else. I had an older friend called Terry who had had a few, com a few problems. And I said, well, Terry's died? You mean Terry in Stoke Newington? He said, no, no, our Terry, Terry Higgins, is dead. Suddenly he wasn't there anymore. You know, somebody that we trusted and loved and, and uh, liked a great deal, um, and certainly a character, um, not to be there anymore was a huge shock. T to see this person that you've grown up with and had so much fun with. Over only, I've known Terry maybe eight years or something, but it felt like a lifetime. And you lost your right arm, one could say. You know, he was a great person in our lives and just greatly missed. Yeah. It was a long time before I actually knew factually what Terry had died from, even though it kind of knew anyway. Um, the physicians wouldn't let me know. Even though I had arranged for the collection of the body and paid for the funeral, um, and I was, the, was effectively the next of kin, because uh, he had no family, um, they wouldn't tell me what he died of. And uh, when we were trying to set up the Terence Higgins Trust, or Terry Higgins Trust at that time, um, I, I wrote to uh, the consultant physician who had been in charge of his care, and he refused to, to give me any information. About a year after uh, Terry had died, um, I ran into those, uh, some of the junior physicians who'd been uh, taking care of Terry at the time. They, they wouldn't tell me either, but they said, well, we're writing up his case. Um, we've, uh, we did an autopsy, and uh, you can read about what he died from from in uh, one of the medical journals. And they named, it was either the Lancet or the BMJ at the time. And so I did, I found out what he died from by um, looking it up in a medical journal. We decided amongst ourselves, Martin, Rupert, Lenny, a group of us, we sat and talked about what we can do, maybe raise some funds, look into research, for this disease and basically get something done about it. Jason White and Floyd Pierce from Hong Gossip at the time and uh, oh, lots of people. Um, uh, Nick Ball was another one. Um, and at least they supported me and said, well, if you're going to do this, then, then, you know, how do we do it? Do we name it in... in, in um, in response to Terry and, and uh, in his memory, if you like. To, and, and, and I think that that idea formulated itself and we put our hands up and said, well, at least we want to have a community response. We want to make sure that we have a voice. When the epidemic started in the early uh, 1980s, there was absolutely no knowledge of what the cause was or indeed if there was uh, a disease as such. People were only starting to get to know that there was a, um, a problem through um, gay news uh, that was going around and then increasingly th from kind of talk in the community, on the, in the pubs and clubs. Uh, but there was no awareness and uh, that was one of the first obstacles that had to be overcome. The early days at the THT also, 
Um, I remember we, we, we were appealing for some funds that we could, A, run a health education um, campaign. We knew we had to produce leaflets. I know, I know we copied a lot from what was being said in New York, San, San, San Francisco. And I had a lot of long distance uh, phone calls with people like Mel Rosen at the Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York. And um, he helped us formulate those very, very early leaflets. We were handing out in nightclubs. We were, um, you know, but we were being thrown out of nightclubs at the same time because they didn't, it was affecting business. You know, a lot of these bars had, were, were in a very fragile state. They, you know, they'd just been opened, there's a lot of money gone into them. And here was somebody saying, you've got to stop this. Or at least to their mind, it sounded like I was saying, we've got to stop this. I, no, I never ever said, we have to stop anything at all. But I wanted people to be aware that, that, that this would come in. And if we, you know, in my naive sense, I believed that we could actually stop it. I actually truly believe that if enough people knew about this, we could stop AIDS coming into the United Kingdom. Because there were so few cases at that point. And I knew if we were strong enough, hard enough, and we were in the right centers, then, um, then something could be done about that. It did turn into a 24-hour job. My telephones were going uh, 24 hours a day. I had to get friends in to answer phones and let me sleep for a few hours. And then, of course, you get people who had been recently diagnosed. And that was a um, uh, you know, difficult situation because I had no training there was you know there was you know i was i was the first one out there you know and uh um that was that was difficult because i think that um what we what we found was that a lot of these chaps had been um they'd left home they'd often broken families so um you know that the boy would would come and live in london in those days of course it's very simple to come to london and get a bed sit and and the likes of when they had a diagnosis or indeed when they were when they became very ill um it was kind of difficult because you had you had this situation where you had to try and bring if it was at all possible bring families together um on a deathbed sometimes and um, that was that was very rewarding in some some senses. I became um, great friends with some families who not only had to come to terms with their with their son's homosexuality, but they had to come to terms with the fact that their son had been given um, a terminal um, diagnosis. So um, I felt that that you know. These things started to highlight the areas where I believe the THT could be very effective. It was being, um, to, to, to help facilitate those things, to let the chap realize that he wasn't alone. Because in, in, all, in some cases, we couldn't reconcile families. These chaps had been deserted by their friends, maybe. They'd been deserted by their families. So they were alone. Well, I got involved 28 years ago with THT, so directly involved in a more in, in, in HIV and, and AIDS um, in 88, 1988, beginning of 1988. Um, and I didn't know what to do. I just started there and I started doing the post and then eventually went on to reception in the main office at the, on, uh, greeting people and um, hated it. I was on there for three years on the reception, but in that time I got involved with the helpline and that was my main start of being involved really in, 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 in terms of like a counselling way because then I went on to be trained as a counsellor in early 89. THT had a counselling course and it was the first one that I went on, that they ran, it was the first one. We covered things like sexuality, death and bereavement and loss, clearly AIDS and the stigma about AIDS and, um, <clears throat> and loss. There was a lot of loss because we had to, when you're involved with THT in those days, 
you had to attend bereavement sessions because so many people we knew were dying. They were, <clears throat> you know, because there was only AZT in those days and that was really killing people. It wasn't doing any good for most of the people. I sometimes think all those people that died at the time, you just dealt with it. You had to deal with it. Because, um, and while there was support, you know, you, you still had to, like your, my friends and people we just got to know if you've been in the THC, um, were dying constantly. Ill. Young people, all ages, young people, you know, you'd see him f looking really fit. I remember, I won't say his full name, James, he was only like 21, and he looked great with really long hair and and then within a year he looked emaciated and really ill. Really ill. And um, I can't remember when he died. I moved to London from Wales in 1985 to come to college. And, uh, and at that point, obviously, there was a, a lot of information around about HIV. There was not a lot of knowledge, but there was a lot of uh, fear around it. Um, 87 was when the, the Tombstone campaign came out. Um, and so there was a lot of awareness. Uh, and I took upon myself to get tested every year. I thought it was a logical thing to do. Um, I used condoms, I was safe, but um, there were still so many questions about how it was transmitted that it seemed the right thing to do. So annual checkups from my default setting, always with that anxiety, because it was a two week wait in those days to find out whether you, whether you had it or not. And, um, and that went on and I was negative um, until uh, 1991. Uh, and that was the first year that actually I expected it to be negative. Uh, and in fact, that was the year it turned out positive. Um, it, was a, it was a bit of a shock, to say the least. Um, and I was told when, when I pressed the doctor for what the prognosis was, that I could probably expect um, about five years of life, they thought. Um, given the fact that it was a fairly new diagnosis, um, they said you'll probably have a couple of years of good health, um, and then it'll be a, couple, a, a deterioration over the next couple of years and, and death, that was what it was, the, the prospect at that point. Um, I was in my final year at college and um, I d didn't really know what to do. I kind of figured, well, I'll just finish college and work it from there. Um, I know a lot of people um, went on the benefits and, uh, and made a choice just to sort of get out at that point because they were going to die and what was the point in um, carrying on with all the rest of those things. Uh, but I couldn't really do that for myself. It, I, it, the thought of spending all of my time thinking about it would have driven me crazy. So uh, I finished my degree um, uh, and then went to work. And, and, and that's what I did until I got too ill to work in 1996 when I had to medically retire. I am my mother's son. <laughs> I am very anal. And the thought of someone having to come and clean up the mess, I couldn't bear it. So that was it. I couldn't do it. What was I going to do? And I thought, well, if you can't kill yourself, you better get out and live. You have no future. You're, or certainly back then, one had no future. One was going to be sort of, you know, dead. My self-esteem was on the floor. I had no self-confidence. I had this killer virus sort of coursing around my veins. So sort of I didn't want to go out into sort of, you know, public and, and what have you. And I kind of sort of, you know, ummed and ahed and sort of, you know, did the odd foray into sort of, you know, the odd gay bar, but I didn't want to sort of, you know, meet anyone. You know, you might be desperate for sex, but, you know, as I say, I had this killer virus running around the veins. I didn't want to, in, in, you know, infect anyone. Anyway, sort of, uh, one day I saw in, it was Capital Gay, that there was um, uh, a group called Gays for a Nuclear Free Future. And there was a coach that was going to be leaving from Gays the Word. Uh, it was leaving at 11 o'clock in the morning for a stand together around Greenham, Burfield and Aldermaston. Greenham Common for, uh, for the American Air Force Base and Aldermaston and Burfield were the nuclear establishments. And so I thought, well, what better way to sort of go out but on a sort of political demonstration. So down I went, full of trepidation, because I thought, I'm not going to know anybody. You know, I'm unclean. 
you know, I felt like I'd got leper written sort of, you know, across the forehead. Um, but anyway, sort of uh, screwed up my courage, down I went. And I just remember sort of arriving sort of on Marchmont Street and I saw this extraordinary guy who was wearing these amazing pantaloons. They were sort of ochre and, uh, and crimson. And he was wearing Wellington boots and he had this shock of, uh, of, uh, of dark curls. And uh, that turned out to be uh, Nigel, Nigel Young. I didn't deal with it very well. I mean, I, I got drunk a lot and, uh, and I couldn't tell anybody because uh, at that time, you just didn't know how people would react. Uh, um, so, you know, though I was carrying all of this in my mind, but trying on the outside to just carry on life as normal. And it was, you know, I just couldn't, couldn't do it. For me, I thought I was very lucky because I met uh, meeting Nigel. He was a particularly political animal. So politics was important to him. And then, of course, sort of, you know, one gets to, to 1984 and there is the miners' strike. We get involved with lesbian and gay men support the miners. And that was an extraordinary kind of uh, adventure because what was important was, you know, for us, you know, we had to sort of beat the government, we had to support the miners, and there was a whole sort of raison d'etre. And that was the other thing which, you know, when you have a diagnosis, the important thing is, for me was anyway, to keep busy, you know, because the busier you are, the less time you have to think about sort of the fact that you're going to die, you're going to die a horrible death, because, you know, that was all the information that one was getting, that people were dying, you know, horrible, horrible sort of uh, deaths. So the more that one can sort of keep busy, you know, the, uh, the better it was. And, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's how one, for, you know, for, for me, that's how I got through displacement activity. That's the most important thing. I kind of took a decision that the public perception of people with HIV as a threat um, was so wrong and the kind of violence that was being shown towards people with HIV, uh, all the stuff about it being God, God's punishment, which, you know, if you follow that logic, it means people with HIV deserve to have it, and people with AIDS deserve to die. I mean, it was so distorted and cruel. Looking back on it, it seems extreme to say it, but I used to avoid standing near the edge in, in the tube, just in case there was some nutcase who decided that you know, I was not being punished enough by God and you know, thought he'd help God along. I couldn't, couldn't accept it and I had to try and change it. And I thought one way of doing that would be to go on television and just talk about uh, what it was like as fairly ordinary human being to, to have this disease and that it, just seeing a person talking about it would hopefully give the public something to empathise with. Um, so I, and I felt I had nothing to lose, you know, even if, um, you know, people reacted violently to me, uh, you know, I, I, I knew that I had HIV, you know, no, I didn't, uh, nobody would be harmed because of that other than me. So, uh, so I guess, I mean, my life really became, I, I became an activist. There was a blaze of bigotry from the press, where once there was ignorance, now there was hysteria. The situation had become so bleak that something had to be done. Norman Fowler traveled to America to see how they were dealing with the crisis he was shocked to find that they were struggling. When I went to San Francisco, I suddenly found the whole of the press, and the American press and television with me. We didn't seek it, actually. I was going on a fact-finding uh, mission. But we went to the general hospital there. And in the ward, one of the wards was absolutely full of young men who were dying uh, of AIDS. And there was 
absolutely nothing we could do about it. And that's what really brought it home to me, how desperately serious it was and how desperately important it was that we needed to warn people that at our state of knowledge then, we had no way of combating it. I was still uh, doing quite a lot of, uh, being on television quite a lot. Um, and I mean, the reactions I, I would get uh, from people were mostly positive. Um, there were some letters which got sent to the BBC, which were pretty unpleasant. Um, but I think, I think I was lucky. I mean, nobody was kind of directly abusive to me. Um, I knew it happened to uh, other people who were out about their HIV status and uh, worse things happened. I mean, there was violence to some people and excreta being pushed through letterboxes and um, I mean, being public, I mean, it was a risk. I was taking a risk. Jonathan Grimshaw has set up a special self-help group for those people infected with the virus. His biggest problem is helping them to cope with the social stigma. People feel desperately anxious, um, overwhelmed by what they have to face up to. And quite often people think that the easiest way out is just to commit suicide. Within the first two weeks of diagnosis, a friend of mine took me along to um, a pub, a gay, a gay pub in, in, in London called the Vauxhall Tavern, um, to, uh, I believe it was um, Body Positive's second social event. And um, I found myself in this bar, and there was, I don't know, 20, 20, 30 guys in there, in this room, all who had recently been diagnosed with HIV. I think that was a real turning point in my life. Um, up until that point, I felt incredibly isolated and um, hopeless, I guess, and, and very afraid about what was going to happen. The name was obviously a play on being HIV positive, but it was also you know, trying to convey a message that you know, just because you had this um, virus, your life wasn't necessarily at an end. And there were ways in which you could kind of start to think about how you could get back some control of your life. And um, so we started to, we published a newsletter, we reorganized discos where, because everybody else there would be HIV positive, you didn't have to go through the whole thing about, should I tell people or what do I say if somebody asks me? Uh, we used to, we had a hospital visiting group, so volunteers would visit people who were ill in hospital. We had a telephone helpline, so clinics, if somebody was in the, just getting a te positive test result would be given a card with a number on saying, if you want to talk to somebody else who's been through this, here's a number you can call. I organised this massive jumble sale at Heaven which was a fundraising event, so that Jonathan could get his first uh, office space in Earl's Court, to get computers and to get uh, photostat copiers and this kind of thing, office chairs. It was an, a great success. At the 1986 Pride March, we had a, a banner, and um, some of us were marching under that banner, and that was the first time, I think, that anybody with HIV had sort of come out in a sort of public setting like that. And it was pretty, it was pretty frightening because, I mean, although uh, I guess members of the public seeing the banner body positive wouldn't know what it meant, if anybody had stopped us and said, well, what does that mean? We would have had to explain that, well, we, we've got HIV, we're HIV positive. And, we didn't know, you know, would somebody punch us in the face or run or uh, we didn't know. But it was all about, you know, trying to, uh, I suppose, seize back um, the idea that life isn't over. You can still do things. You can do, you can look after your health. Uh, if you can't do anything about the virus inside you, then you can do something about the virus outside you by helping other people or uh, talking about um, what it's like. 
to to have the virus. It's good that the newspapers have actually picked up on AIDS, but there's ways of representing it, actually making sure that you increase people's knowledge as opposed to increasing their hysteria. A friend of mine who works in the hairdressing salon, um, his employer tried to insist that he go and have an AIDS test simply because he was a gay man for no other reason at all. He wasn't showing any symptoms. Uh, another friend of mine who works in the food industry serving food to people and his employees were paranoid that he was going to spit on the food and, and, and pass AIDS to, to, uh, to the customers, which is just painfully ludicrous because if, if AIDS were that easily transmissible, half the country would be dead by now. There was panic, hysteria, blaming, scapegoating. You know, HIV and AIDS was depicted as, quote, the gay plague. There were headlines in the papers warning that a million people could die. The government's response was still very, very slow. While it was only affecting gay and bisexual men, there was massive media and government indifference. The attitude seemed to be, we don't care. The government's response only happened when heterosexual people began to be diagnosed with the disease. Doctors are alarmed at what they see as government complacency and lack of funding to combat the spread of the infection. In the United States, only four years ago, they had the same situation, 200 cases of AIDS. They now have 12,000 cases of AIDS only four years later. So we're already at the beginning of an epidemic, you know that? Yes, we know that for certain. How much money in that case is being spent on research and on combating this epidemic? Pitifully little. As much as I don't have time for tourists, I have to say that Norman Fowler, he has been extraordinary. The fact that he told Margaret Thatcher that there was HIV within the heterosexual community really sort of galvanised her in terms of putting lots and lots of money into sort of uh, HIV and AIDS. What he didn't tell her was the full story that it was in, a, in the heterosexual population of the intravenous drug users of Edinburgh. Because I'm quite sure that she would have then said, let them die. Margaret Thatcher's view was, I, it's always rather a curious view, I thought, but her view was that if you started to tell people in this frank way, you were telling young people things that they knew nothing about. And the implication of that was that they would immediately go out and do these things. Well, that, of course, is the total antithesis of a public education campaign. And uh, I'm sure there were many things that Margaret Thatcher was right on and I was wrong on. But on this, I think I was right and she was wrong. There is absolutely no evidence that people went out uh, and simply followed uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the advice um, in a negative way. What they did was that they followed the advice and the result was uh, that uh, HIV came down and other sexual uh, disease came down as well. So there was no question that um, it had a major impact as far as HIV was concerned. The government decided to send a letter to every house in the country warning them about AIDS. And um, uh, we, we uh, found that this uh, letter was, it was all printed and ready for dispatch. And uh, it, it um, gave what information was available at the time. But at the end of it, it said, if you want further information, and it ring our switchboard number. Now, at the time, we had three lines, which were pretty busy anyway, and there was no way that the whole country was going to be able to get through to us. And obviously, this was uh, uh, going to lead to panic. What we did was persuade uh, the government, we heard about this, uh, persuade the Department of Health to um, set up what was it effectively became the National AIDS Helpline, which was operated on a much uh, a bigger scale than we were able to operate. And um, they put these leaflets in an envelope uh, and they overprinted on the envelope for uh, further information, ring National AIDS Helpline and gave that, that number, thank goodness. But we still were absolutely swamped with calls from the general public. Uh, for all oh, months, uh, months and months afterwards. So here I had 
on the one side, I understood about marketing, I understood about getting a message across to targeted groups, and I realized that, that HIV wasn't a, 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 a one plaster fix it all. You had to target individual groups and you had to be able to uh, get that across. On the other side of the thing, I realized that it, that it was a business. You had to get the right lawyers, the right uh, bankers, and all those sorts of things. And, um, and there I was, um, uh, a deaf man in the middle, um, looking for somebody to do this. And um, I kind of, you know, did many, many times wonder, what on earth are you doing there? And, you know, sort of one day I'd be doing Panorama and uh, News Night and, and um, what was the horizon. And, and the next day I'd be answering telephones. The next day I'd be rushing off and, and visiting somebody in hospital. And all the time I was looking for somebody to take that over. I really didn't want to be doing any of that. And uh, I guess I was very fortunate um, in... Uh, being aware um, as an activist, I think, of, of a case um, a couple of years before of uh, a man being fired from British home stores of all places, and that was Tony Whitehead. I had been working abroad in the early 80s, so was quite out of touch with the news, news that was coming out of America. Um, but I was a, when I was back in the country, I was a volunteer for London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard, and Switchboard was particularly exercised at what was happening, um, and organised a meeting at the Conway Hall with uh, the Health Education Authority or the Health Education Council. It's changed its name over the years, and also some people from New York and friends of Terry Higgins who had who had been in the paper as one of the first people affected. And his friends very courageously wanted to bring it to people's attention, um, to raise awareness, to raise money for, for, for the resources that were needed, and had formed the Terry Higgins Trust. And I sat in the hall and listened, listened to it, and those first-person accounts of what was happening, of what people had seen happening to their community and to their loved ones, really, really affected me. And so I stood up at the end of the meeting and said that people who wanted to get together to form some kind of response to what was happening, um, please, let's, let's meet and, and let's arrange some, some further meetings. From that day, the Terence Higgins Trust, as we know it, the Terry Higgins Trust changed to include wider briefs. The name changed and it became a, a charity, registered charity. And we obtained offices. We were working very, very hard. My parting shot was assisting um, in getting the very, very, very first uh, big AIDS benefit um, off the ground uh, without people like George Michael and uh, Elton John who came together right at that moment and were prepared to, um, to come into Wembley and uh, put on an amazing concert. We were able, I think, to, um, to be assured that the Terence Higgins Trust would survive at that point. In the 80s, it was really interesting. In the UK, it was the gay community that reacted first and fastest to HIV. But that gay community contained some lesbians. There was something of a mixed gay movement then, not as mixed as it is now, but there were quite a few of us lesbians who were working alongside and with gay men on Gay Switchboard. It wasn't even called Lesbian and Gay Switchboard then, but Gay Switchboard, which was the first place to respond um, there were women who were writing occasionally for Capital Gay, which was the first uh, gay newspaper to really talk about HIV. And we thought it might be poppers, we thought it might be all kinds of things. But the lesbians were there, not all of, not all of us, but quite a few of us were there alongside the gay men. And it was 
we didn't know at first how to respond. I mean, there were a number of things that happened. First of all, I remember really brilliant initiatives like when gay men were barred from giving blood in 1985, when, when people started to work out that this was a blood-borne virus. And a group of lesbians, including a friend of mine, Lorraine Trenchard, started a, a lesbian blood donation drive to make up for the gay men not being able to give blood. Um, quite a few of us were on things like switchboard trying to help and work things out. I remember on switchboard for years we ended every single call from a gay man with have you heard about AIDS? Every single call to the point where people started to say to us um, oh for goodness sakes you've said that for the last three times I've called you. It's like well good listen think about it. Um, there was also there was a really weird thing where people who were striving for lesbian and gay equality, and it was lesbian and gay equality then, LGBT is a much more recent development, but for people who were striving for lesbian and gay equality, there was a lot of basic level misunderstanding of things like epidemiology. And so if they had all this stuff for gay men who had HIV, they felt they had to have stuff for lesbians. So for years, Terence Higgins Trust's best-selling leaflet to local authorities was lesbians and HIV, which basically said, um, you're probably not going to get it, but try not to sleep with men or share needles. Um, you know, it, it was ridiculous. I remember somebody uh, who was, I mean, she was a lovely woman, giving me a leaflet to proofread that she was trying to produce in London um, for lesbians about safer sex. And it was like four pages of dental dams and a tiny mention of try not to sleep with men. Uh, and it was just ridiculous. And I said, come on, girl, I know you. Have you ever used a dental dam? If the sex is any good, if you've got a dental dam, you won't know which side is which within five minutes. It was just ridiculous. There were all these things that we tried to do to make ourselves somehow equal to gay men in all the wrong ways. And the difficulty is that within that, there were some lesbians who got HIV, not many, but a few, but the ways in which they got HIV were ways that you couldn't talk about in the politically correct lesbian community of the time. You couldn't talk about the fact that some lesbians had sex with men, and actually, if they were involved in the movement, the men they had sex with tended to be gay, who were at higher risk. You couldn't talk about the fact that lesbians used drugs and injected and shared needles. Um, and you couldn't talk about all sorts of other things that lesbians might do, the, the very few ways in which it was possible and is possible for lesbians to pass HIV around uh, things that brought blood into the bedroom and things like that. We just couldn't talk about those things. So I remember doing loads of lesbian safer sex workshops, um, just trying to get those issues across. Uh, and there was a, a group of lesbians uh, in the States who had HIV, mostly from injecting drug use, who people wouldn't take seriously. But on the other hand, I also remember, to the eternal embarrassment of my lesbian sensibility, a string of women who pretended they had HIV, lesbian, it was, we called it lesbians Munchausen. You know, women who pretended that they had HIV to gain some kind of distorted privilege within the community. And they would become a, you know, a cause celebre for five minutes and then somebody would explode the fact that they actually didn't have HIV and they'd disappear back into obscurity. And that happened four or five times. Um, there's one woman I still see around who spent years telling everyone she had HIV. Did she hell? I'd refused medication. Um, when I was diagnosed, they said, oh, look, there's this uh, one drug that we have, AZT, uh, and it seems to have some effect. Um, but the information they gave me uh, told me, really, that it, it seemed to have some effect, but it didn't seem to have a great effect. And everything I read about it seemed to say that the side effects were as bad as the HIV was. Um, and so I refused the medication. Um, the doctor at the time didn't like the fact that I refused it. Um, he said uh, words along the lines of, if you're not going to be willing to be responsible for your own health, why should I be treating you? Um, and I said, well, you probably shouldn't be treating me, and I'll get another doctor, thank you very much. Um, and that's what I did uh, until I found a doctor that was good. And I, I went through, I think, two or three until I found somebody that was willing to, to talk to me on, a, on an equal footing. Um, and, and involve me in the discussions rather than just prescribe what I should do. Then, out of the fear, came hope in the form of a drug called AZT. Could this be the cure? AZT was a failed chemotherapy drug. 
When I was first diagnosed and I was at the, uh, the Middlesex, they had um, a trial which was called the Concord trial. And in that, people were going to be given AZT. Um, and it was going to be three grams a day. What they wanted to do was they wanted to split people the, the, into two groups so that you would have one group that got the AZT and the other group that got the placebo. And that way they supposedly sort of would balance it off. So I said, well, all right, if you're going to sort of um, give me, for instance, the AZT, will you have my opposite, you know, who's going to be similar metabolism to me, similar weight to me? So, you know, just so that you actually can see what's going on. Oh, no, 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 they said, sort of, you know, that's, that's too complicated. We can't do that. And I sort of saw red. And I said, well, all right, if you could put a line down the middle of me and you give one half the AZT and the other half the placebo, then I can kind of see that you could gauge sort of how things are working. But if you can't be bothered to sort this out, I'm not interested. And basically that saved my life because everybody who was given the AZT, you got a gram in the morning, a gram in the afternoon and a gram at night and it killed them. You know, it was this failed chemotherapy drug that wiped all your sort of, your good helper cells out. And it was horrendous. And I sort of, you know, knew a number of people who were on the monotherapy and it was not a nice death. Despite all of the work that I did to try and stay healthy, um, sure enough, about five years later, um, I started to get ill. Um, first with Candida, my CD4 count dropped. And then I developed Kaposi's sarcoma, the, the age-related cancer. And so with the CD4 count of less than 200, the Candida and the KS, I was given an AIDS diagnosis. Um, and I wasn't really prepared for it. Um, I'd, I'd spent all of my time thinking, well, you know, that whole HIV equals AIDS equals death thing. Um, I can have HIV and just not progress to AIDS. There are people that seem to be doing quite well in America, long-term survivors, and they're doing pretty well. I'm gonna be one of those. So when I got the AIDS diagnosis, that kind of threw me because I didn't know where to go from there. My friends were all at work. I didn't have anybody around me. And so at that point, I got um, in touch with Terence Higgins Trust um, and spoke to them about arranging a buddy. Uh, and that was fantastic. It was a lifeline because I was stuck at home 24-7. Uh, my lungs were so bad that I had an oxygen tank just to get from room to room. Um, and I had a woman that lived locally that came around uh, at least once a week and just sat and chatted in, in the daytime, which was when I was obviously most isolated. I had friends that I'd see occasionally in the evenings, uh, but the days just stretched so long uh, when you're stuck at home and, and daytime TV is enough to drive anyone mad, I think. So it was a, a real lifeline just having somebody that was there that could talk or bring me occasional things that I needed. Um, and then uh, when, I, uh, when I moved to North London, about a year or so later, um, I got a new buddy that was in the, in the local area in North London as well, which lasted for another year and a half. And again, it was, a, it was just a, an amazing asset to have when it was an area that I didn't know. There weren't any friends locally, uh, and there was just somebody there that was there to be supportive and just to, to help out when I needed it. We had hundreds of volunteers in those days that were prepared to follow the American model of, uh, of the buddy scheme, whereas we would volunteer. But of course, setting up a buddy scheme, you have to then support the buddies. You can't just put them into these situations. We had to develop groups to allow the bedding system. One thing that really concerned me was the panicked, hysterical and repressive response that AIDS evoked in those early days. There were calls for the mass quarantining of everyone with HIV. Uh, that there should be compulsory testing, particularly of gay and bisexual men. Um, you know, there were extraordinary examples of people being subjected to outright blatant discrimination. Two friends of mine went to their local pub. They were known to be gay. Um, they refused to serve them, telling them they had to bring their own glasses in order to get a pint. I mean, these were the kinds of hysterical overreactions that were commonplace. 
So in early 1987, together with Phil Cox of Spectrum Radio, who was himself HIV positive, I set up the UK AIDS Vigil Organisation. We set this organisation up around the same time, unbeknown to us, that ACT UP was being formed in the United States. Um, this was the first organisation in Britain specifically dedicated to defend the human rights of people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, our initial project was to provide a counterbalance to the World Health Minister's Summit on AIDS, which was scheduled to take place in London in January 1988. This was the first ever world gathering of health ministers to discuss what the global response to HIV and AIDS should be. So we felt it was very, very important to flag up the human rights of people living with HIV and AIDS. Sometime after setting up Body Positive, a friend of mine who was a Lambeth councillor uh, rang me up and said, look, we're, we, we need to do something for uh, people with HIV uh, in South London. There were Body Positive. Most of the people who were coming to Body Positive uh, were sort of based in West London. So, uh, so I went along and um, with a group of other people, we planned this uh, centre, uh, drop-in centre uh, for people in South London to be called uh, the Landmark. You've got information, you've got food, uh, you've got sort of counselling. Um, they had uh, run taxi service or, or volunteer drivers. Um, so to, to ferry people to and from, uh, from, uh, from hospital. And I was taken on to create it, really, to develop it and get the funding and uh, find the building and employ staff. And uh, that opened in 1989. For the march, a rally in Hyde Park calling on governments to do more to help those with AIDS. It wasn't just a cure that was sought. It was dignity. A turning point came in 1988, when a vigil took place in Hyde Park in London. It showed respect, and it spread to the world summit of HIV and AIDS, just one mile away. I can remember that evening so well. It was an incredibly moving, spectacular occasion. The whole of Whitehall, from Parliament Square to Trafalgar Square, was filled with thousands and thousands of people. A, a sea of flickering candles as far as you could see. Um, we marched to the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Center, which is the venue of the summit, and there were speeches uh, and appeals for governments around the world who'd gathered in London to reject discrimination and repression in favor of education and support. The next day, to coincide with the opening of the summit, we held an alternative AIDS and HIV conference in the next door, Westminster Central Hall. Uh, this was, I believe, the world's first ever AIDS and human rights conference, where we set out a manifesto to tackle discrimination and prejudice against people living with HIV and AIDS. We had some fantastic speakers, including Derek Jarman, the filmmaker, who came out as HIV positive. A very important, impactful statement from a well-known and respected public figure. The following day, I wangled a press pass and interrupted one of the main plenaries of the summit to demand that World Health Ministers uh, end repression and switch to education, care and support. Um, I was bundled out and left feeling very uncertain about whether I'd actually had an impact. Much to my surprise and delight, the closing statement from the summit did appeal to governments worldwide to end repression and switch to education, care and support for people living with HIV and AIDS. That was a world first and it made a huge global impact. Um, activists worldwide used that statement to challenge the policies of their governments. And it didn't always work, but in many instances, 
that statement was a template that was used successfully by many HIV and AIDS organisations to turn around their government's repressive authoritarian response to HIV AIDS and switch it to education, care and support. The UK AIDS Vigil Organisation continued after the World Health Minister's Summit in early 1988. But by that time, ACT UP in the United States was grabbing the headlines and lots of people in Britain want to form their own branch of ACT UP. So we decided that the Vigil Organisation would merge in to the newly formed London ACT UP, which was established in early 1989. One of our first ever protests was outside Pentonville Prison, where we catapulted condoms over the prison walls in order to protest at the way in which the prison service was not providing condoms for prisoners, and thereby helping to fuel the HIV epidemic in prison. Interestingly, the ACT UP group in London that emerged um, with lots of people involved, Jimmy Somerville, um, Paul Burston, lots and lots of people got involved with ACT UP, um, was targeting the press. It was targeting media, bigotry and prejudice. I can remember after that very first demonstration at the Daily Mail, Tony Whitehead and myself went up to see the editor of the Daily Mail, who was, a, you can imagine, a deeply, profoundly uninterested in us in a way, but he was forced to, to listen to what we had to say because there were a couple of hundred men and women down there yelling outside his front door, you know. So, I mean, ACT UP, I think it's a complicated issue. I, as I say, I don't think you can just magically transfer one tradition of politics from one country to another. ACT UP, in a way, is very much the product in America of a country without socialised medicine. That's the key difference. Here we have socialised medicine. It was never an issue in the same way. ACT UP in France was very pointed because the government failed very much more conspicuously in France than the British government did. And because there was very little identity politics in France anyway, a very weak sense of community prevailed in France in 1987-88. So ACT UP helped forge a sense of collective community identity which pre-existed the epidemic here in London. Loads of French people would come to, to London in the 80s to find out what was going on at the Terence Higgins Trust to try and imitate similar, a similar kind of interest there. For me, I suppose the main indirect impact of ACT UP, apart from my personal inspiration by uh, the bravery and the courage and the in sheer invention and good humour of those people, was the sense that we could come, so we could use a kind of national lesbian and gay politics in, in, the, in the face of Section 28 to keep AIDS awareness going so that the issue didn't go off the boil. Margaret Thatcher sort of brought in this horrendous sort of uh, Section 28. So suddenly, you know, the idea of teaching any form of sort of information around homosexuality within schools was completely forbidden. You know, it was the whole thing about promotion of sort of homosexuality was, was out. So where were kids or where are kids going to get information? Section 28. Uh, which Margaret Thatcher's government passed um, and we ministers went along with it and personally I totally regret that decision and I think most of my colleagues do. It was totally unjustified, it was a great mistake. It would never be made, that mistake would never be made uh, today. In 2015, the United Nations estimated that the number of people who have contracted HIV was 78 million. The truth is, we will never know. All we do know is that every one of those numbers is a life. I'd met this guy in a sauna down in Rottendean and near Brighton, and uh, we'd exchanged addresses and, uh, um, on, on post-it notes in the car park. Uh, it was pouring down and I'd shoved it into my wallet and there forgot about it because uh, I certainly wasn't opening the window to, uh, to rip it up and push it out of. And uh, four weeks later, um, I found it in my wallet uh, on a plane um, when I was flying down from uh, Glasgow to London for a long weekend. And I gave him a call and he became my first boyfriend. And I was in love with him. Um, always been safe. 
Um, we were always safe. Um, it never worried me. I knew enough about being safe. Um, earlier, um, when I'd been a, a young man, I'm a little bit of American blood in me, and I'd been out in San Francisco or Los Angeles, perhaps with the Navy, and uh, in the late 70s or early 80s, and uh, I'm afraid we all fucked like bunnies. And, uh, um, and there's no humor around HIV, but in a strange way, um, because of a little fastidiousness, I protected myself because I had this thing um, that I really didn't want to get a bit of turd on my todger, so to speak. So I always wore a condom um, in the late 70s and 80s, and in fact, I always have. And I often wonder at a time when we knew nothing about what lay ahead, that, you know, that's the reason why I'm sat here today. Um, and a lot of other people, alas, are not. But my boyfriend and I, we became a, um, a good pair. Um, I moved down from Scotland. I took over a job as um, head of young officers training based in Portsmouth, running what was colloquially known in the Navy as the officer watch course. And I lived my Jekyll and Hyde existence. I had my fabulous boyfriend called Dennis, who lived down in Croydon. And we saw as much of one another as we could. I'd spend weekends in Croydon. He'd spend weekends um, in Portsmouth. Um, he lived with his family. Um, he had a very sort of straight-laced dad. Um, and after one too many times on the sofa in the living room there, I complained bitterly. He complained bitterly, and I was allowed to sleep in his bed thereafter by his, by his dad and his mum. Mum couldn't really care. Um, and uh, so long as nothing happened. So, of course, lots did happen, but we were just very quiet. As I came up towards the last period of my appointment in this position, training young officers in Portsmouth, with my next job almost certainly being second in command of a guided missile destroyer, I decided that really I was getting fed up with living this Jekyll and Hyde existence, that I needed to be there for him if he became ill in the future, and I therefore decided that I would resign early. And I had to think up some conflated reason for why I was giving up my uh, prospect of a, of a you know, admiral's sort of uh, sword for um, returning to Civvy Street. But I did, and the Navy said, well, you're going to have to, um, we're going to have to ask a year's service off you, a year's notice. Um, return of service, it was called. And that was fine. And during the last few months of that period, Dennis became unwell and was in and out of hospital. And then during my last four weeks, um, he was in hospital permanently. And he died quietly, he arrested, um, after having had pneumonia, two days before my last day in the Navy. And the good thing was, the Navy had taught me well. They had taught me to be the last person still coping the captain on the bridge. Um, and um, I was able to cope, and I could cope for myself and for my friends, our friends. All his gay friends became my first gay friends. A lot of them were positive as well. And for his family. And my colleagues in the Navy never knew. And uh, I managed to get the day off after he died, my penultimate day. And uh, then I came in on the final Friday and handed over my department and hosted a cocktail party for a couple of hundred people and the Commander-in-Chief downwards and left the Navy. And on the following morning, I woke up in our bed and I reflected that the only two things that had really mattered to me ever in my life had both gone in just 48 hours. And he died on 8th of April, 1992. And I grieved for six months, and I came through it. And 
On the way out through it, I decided that I wanted to give something back, both to the gay world um, and also to the world of HIV and AIDS. And one of the first places I heard about was a place called London Lighthouse in London. Uh, and this was Europe's first centre for people, uh, in support of people living with HIV and AIDS. And moreover, it had what we called a residential unit, it might be known as a hospice, but we never called it that, where um, people could come um, in their final weeks. Christopher Spence had been working for an organisation which provided counselling for people around dying. So I phoned him up and said, look, uh, this is what we're doing. Uh, we need to develop some kind of support for our volunteers. Can you help us? So he did, and um, he began to think, because he'd been working in the area of dying, uh, he began to think about, well, what should we be doing for people with AIDS who are dying? And uh, he began to think about um, developing a hospice. So yeah, I found myself in this room full of gay men, um, which was being facilitated by Christopher Spence. And we talked about this idea of setting up a centre for people with HIV in London, which was ultimately to become London Lighthouse. And daycare facilities and a 24-bed hospice. Building began in April last year on a Victorian school in West London. The new day centre could be used by hundreds of people. The top floor hospice will care for people dying of AIDS, the entire building offering a unique integrated service. What's unique about it is that it is an integrated model of care, um, providing services to people affected by HIV and AIDS, um, right from diagnosis all the way through to the provision of terminal care for people who develop AIDS and die. The centre will cost £2 million a year to run and employ 90 staff, caring for some of the country's 1,700 AIDS cases, people like Nigel. It's very important to be able to come to a welcoming place with people who understand and care, <clears throat> where you can talk about your hopes and aspirations or your fears. I guess throughout the, the, the late 80s and the early 90s, I was a patient here, um, upstairs in the residential unit. Um, I came here for respite care, um, usually after being discharged from hospital for various HIV-related conditions. Um, but also, I spent a lot of time here um, supporting friends uh, and, my, uh, and, and, and lovers um, who, were, who were dying with HIV or as a result of AIDS. There are hundreds of people who have had their ashes scattered in this garden. Enough to change the acidity in the soil. I've learned through Lighthouse that um, living well in the moment now um, is the most important thing I can do, and the most helpful thing I can do, until it comes to the time for me to die. And I've also learned that um, death is not something to be feared. It's a very healthy and natural conclusion to life. One of the most difficult things was um, having on the one hand to, uh, as part of the campaigning work, to talk to ministers and uh, sort of senior level in Whitehall and opinion formers, decision makers, and to have to talk to them in a very kind of objective way, while at the same time, there is all this emotional, personal um, stuff going on about, you know, for me and my friends and friends dying and um, trying to contain all of that so that it doesn't uh, affect 
um, the kind of campaigning policy uh, work that, that I was doing. Keeping those two things separate uh, at times was incredibly difficult. During the late 80s and early 90s, I stood by and watched my community die of AIDS. I watched my friends all die of AIDS. I watched two of my partners die of AIDS. I also co-parented two young children with HIV and I saw one of them die as a result of AIDS. That was incredibly difficult for me. Um, I spent a lot of time in therapy and I spent a lot of time learning how to reconnect with my ability to express emotion. As a man, I grew up in a, in a family and in a society where men were, were, were prevented from feeling. Um, there was a sort of prohibition of feeling, if you like. One of the most important things that London Lighthouse did was to create a, an environment where people were given permission to express their feelings. Um, so for me, learning how to cry again was incredibly important. Um, and I now know that crying is a very healthy thing, um, and I'm able to do that when I need to. I've also learned a lot about death, dying, and bereavement, and about grieving. Um, you never get over a death. Um, you never stop grieving, that's my opinion anyway. Um, it becomes part of who you are. Um, so I've learned to live with my feelings and express my feelings as part of my everyday life around the loss of friends and loved ones. Um, so that's been particularly, um, particularly challenging, but it's also been rewarding in a sense because it's enabled me to be, um, to learn how to express myself again and to deal with those feelings. I think that one of the greatest challenges for me, and I know it is for probably all people I meet who are living with HIV, is isolation. Um, isolation's a killer. Um, people with HIV you know, who live in fear of disclosure, who live in fear of uh, status being exposed, um, you know, become very isolated. Um, if you're not in work, you have a little money, or you're living in poverty, um, you're you become very isolated. Um, so isolation is a key one for me, and I spend a lot, put a lot of energy into making sure that I have a really good network of friends around me um, so that I don't become isolated. But I am very concerned about isolation for the, for the other people with HIV who I meet. The hardest things for me living through the last 30 years, I have to say two things. One has been the loss of friends I love to whom I thought would be my friends in my middle age and old age. Many younger friends, in fact, as well as friends of my own age and older. Secondly, my own experience of HIV, which I have to say was, I, I took very badly. It was catastrophic. I really didn't think I was gonna get HIV. I thought, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna get this. I was blown away, absolutely devastated, frankly, because you're never without it, however much care you take. Um, um, so those two fit together for me. One is a public thing about my friends and people I miss, you know, all the time. Um, the other thing is my own life. Um, uh, um, it took me to a very hard place. It takes most people with HIV to a hard place. You come through that in a way, but, you know, anyway. Um, but I also, perhaps I should say in a supplementary way, and not to be too sort of trivialising about it, I think HIV does demonstrate the best in human nature, um, that people can come together from all sorts of backgrounds and overcome what might be all sorts of other differences and difficulties and challenges to share and to achieve common goals. Um, they can, we can give one another confidence, we can give one another inspiration. Leadership doesn't have to be imposed from above, it comes from below, it comes from the work of tens, hundreds of thousands of anonymous, ordinary people who find their voices in emergencies. Now that I'm talking about it, I can see all those people in my mind. Those are people. And I can't always see their faces. I'm glad things changed. 
lots and lots and lots of friends that are not there anymore. And it's so hard sometimes to believe that, it's, that this has happened, that all these people have gone from our lives. Looking back, I feel so proud of the many thousands of people who were involved in the UK AIDS Vigil Organisation, ACT UP, the Terence Higgins Trust, and Frontliners. Those people really did make a difference. They helped change this country's response to HIV and AIDS for the better. Uh, HIV has caused me a lot of problems. I think the uh, biggest thing is uh, a form of post-traumatic stress disorder, which has been awful uh, to live with. Um, another term for that is PTSD, and there is a uh, there are two main forms of that. There's a simple version and a complex version. When you are in a situation where um, of your friends and chosen family, you have lost over 30, 40, 50 people over a period of years, and you kept losing them, and you kept having to go to funerals. It it um, it shatters your um, the way you look at the world and the way you trust the world and that has knock-on effects to how you relate to people, how you relate to yourself, your sense of identity and in conjunction with all the physical consequences of HIV it can be a, uh, well, it is a shattering experience and getting back from that place is really hard. The hardest times for me as I think they must be for so many people involved, was the illness and death of people I loved. Um, my then partner died in 1989 after um, a series of terrible opportunistic infections um, wreaking havoc on his body and his mind finally died at home um, in the summer of 1989 and I remember just the, the contrast between George, my partner, being so ill and all life going out on the streets of summer in London. Um, that was, certainly was, a very, very difficult time. And then it seemed from 89 until the mid 90s, uh, oh, a number of dear and close people became ill and died. I was very fortunate that uh, a year or so after George died, I met a wonderful man that I'm still with. But it was a very, very difficult time when both of us um, became ill and were diagnosed with AIDS in the mid-90s. Um, we had a range of, uh, range of illnesses and so did Francisco Paco, my partner. We were never actually in hospital at the same time, but extremely difficult until the new medications, um, well, they pulled us back from the brink but they couldn't undo the damage that some of the infections had wrought. But we're still here today, and both of us helping here at the London Lighthouse. And um, I count myself very, very fortunate that we have both come this far. My life today is, is beyond what I'd ever dreamed of. I was told I had five years to live, uh, and today I have a mortgage, I'm in a civil partnership, and I have a pension. I didn't start it till I was 37 because of the, the, the time I had to take off being ill. Uh, but I have plans and I'm actually thinking about retirement now, which is uh, an astonishing thing to me. It was so unexpected. Uh, but life is good and I live well with HIV today. Uh, and I think that's the important uh, thing for me is that I, that I am conscious of my health, I live well, and I do the best that I can for myself and for those around me. Nigel and I sort of, you know, continued seeing one another and then eventually Nigel said look I'm living in a squat up in uh, in North London you're living out in the East End sort of isolated 
why don't we uh, we get together and sort of uh, uh, I know of a squat in Brixton why don't we sort of uh, move in there so I thought why not I've got nothing to lose I'm going to be dead next week you might as well just get on and live because that's that's what it was that's what it felt like you know sort of my life was essentially over so just go with it you know whatever happens happens and so sort of uh, we did we sort of we moved in we went from one squat to another squat in Brixton and joined a place called Brixton Housing Corp and uh, basically sort of 30 years on I'm still living there with him <laughs> which is amazing at the very beginning of this trust the person that sticks out to me the most who flew the flag who held the torches is Martin Butler. Martin is a, a great activist, a great mind, a person that th this charity would not be here today without Martin. Martin really is without doubt the backbone of the charity. In any disease or, or, or any um, outbreak, there's what's known as the second wave. And with HIV AIDS, I worry that the second wave could be coming now and all of the worries and all of the fears that we had 30 years ago that didn't materialize, doesn't mean it's not going to, it just means that in fact, we may well have been stored up for what may be coming for the future. And it does concern me that there are young people out there putting themselves at risk. They don't believe they're at risk. They have misinformation. Many people believe that AIDS isn't a killer. Well, it doesn't have to be. But if you leave it and you don't get treated and you're not getting tested, then what's to stop it? It's going to go exactly the same way as perhaps Terry found himself. Within a very, very short time, he went down with pneumonia. Um, what can you do when they're, when they're already close to death's door? That is not the time to be looking for great miracle cures because there isn't a miracle cure for AIDS. There isn't. I think sometimes we wonder what would people who have died from HIV think about the current state of things, particularly in the LGBT community, um, such as uh, equal marriage and equal age of consent, etc. Firstly, I think they'd be amazed at how quickly it has been achieved. But uh, if you look a little deeper at that, the question is why was it achieved so quickly? And I think part, a large part of the, the answer to that question is because how we responded to the HIV pandemic. Um, the LGBT community was in the forefront. We led the response. And uh, in doing so, we showed that we are, we're human. We're just like everybody else. We suffer, we've done our best, we struggle. And that awareness of us just being the same as everybody else was part of people getting to understand that okay, well, why should we discriminate against LGBT people? And that was a key to achieving the equal age of consent and the equal marriage. Uh, and I, I, I think that's it's a wonderful thing. They'd be amazed at how quickly it's been achieved. Uh, but it, those achievements cost a lot. We just seem to lose a whole generation. And, and nobody seems to, until now, really, until this experience, nobody seems to have celebrated that. And I think those people absolutely deserve to be celebrated because we lost creative people, we lost teachers. We lost so many people that were quietly forgotten about because it was a bit, we're ashamed of this, it's unpalatable, let's not talk about that. And it breaks my heart that there were people that, that whose parents didn't know they were gay and they were forced to come out to their parents because they were HIV positive, but then they were rejected and then they died knowing they'd been rejected. And to this day, I think that is absolutely heartbreaking. I've seen the whole, right from the start through to today, and the landscape has changed so much in terms of HIV, it's very hard to encapsulate it. Uh, I think though having had 30 plus years of uh, experience with this um, it's important to recognize that one of the biggest tolls has been mentally it's been very hard to live through 
uh, these decades with so many people dying, assuming that you had less than a year to live, or I had less than a year to live when I was 19, and um, trying to do something about it um, every, you know, every day, every day you get up, trying to make a difference. And it's been a long journey and a difficult road.